Soldiers, the Second Polish War has begun. At Tilsit, Russia pledged an eternal alliance with France and war on England. Today, her oath is broken. She refuses all explanations of her strange conduct unless the French eagles recross the Rhine. Fate draws Russia on, her destiny must be accomplished. Does she then think us degenerate? Are we no longer the soldiers of Austerlitz? She places us between dishonor and war, can our choice be in doubt? Forward then, across the Niemann, and let us carry the war onto her own soil. The Emperor orders the marshals and generals in command of army corps, of divisions and of brigades and colonels to take all measures for maintaining the strictest discipline and for preventing the disorders that are beginning to ravage the country. I am just in. The heat is oppressive and there is much dust which is rather tiring. The whole of the enemy's army was here. It was under orders to fight, but didn't dare to. We had to force our way into Smolensk. The Russian army, which is very discouraged and dissatisfied, is retreating in the direction of Moscow. After having, for 18 months, constantly refused to give me an explanation, Your Majesty has at last, through your minister, placed a summons before me to evacuate Prussia as a preliminary to an understanding. A few days later, this minister asked for his passports and three times repeated that demand. From that moment, I was in a state of war with your majesty. I pity the wickedness of those who could give your majesty such advice. But however it may be, never shall Russia use such language to France. War has therefore begun between us. God himself cannot undo what is done, but I shall always be ready to listen to proposals for peace. And when your majesty really attempts to cut loose from the influence of men who are the enemies of your family, of your glory, and of that of your empire, you will always find me of the same mind and of equal friendship. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV, the documentary streaming service. Magellan has been a fantastic supporter of the work of me and my brother over at History Time for a while now. And with their support, this year we've got a sequel to Japan and the West coming, as well as more full-length documentaries. And also an entirely new channel to look forward to. And this week's recommendation is a great companion piece to our last few videos, Napoleon. An origin story of sorts, it charts Napoleon's remarkable rise to power. A fantastic, well-acted watch. For those that don't know, Magellan is essentially a Netflix for documentaries with the largest range of history stuff anywhere and over 3,000 documentaries in total. It's the perfect way to widen your knowledge on a mountain of topics in 2021. So click on the link in the description for an exclusive month-long free trial for Voices of the Past viewers. Thanks. After throwing up earthworks, batteries and redoubts, and after announcing their intention of defending them, the enemy, as usual, have shown the white feather. We are now in this town, which is sizable, that is to say has eight to ten churches. The country is good, and people say it remains fertile all the way to Moscow. The heat is excessive, the weather splendid. Reports state the enemy are resolved to make a stand at Vyazma. We have reached Vyazma. The enemy continue their retreat to Moscow. Reply to General Jomini that it is absurd to say there is no bread when we have 25 tons of flour a day. Instead of complaining, let him be up at four in the morning, proceeding to the mills and to the baking ovens in person, and bake 30,000 rations of bread every day. If he goes to sleep or if he whines, he will get nothing. We shall soon have a battle that will eat up an enormous amount of powder and supplies. How are we to replenish our stores? Must we send empty wagons back to Vilna? That would mean a month or six weeks before we could get them to the front again. Write to officers commanding army corps that we may lose many men daily because there is no system in the supply service. 
it is urgently necessary that they should take measures in concert with their colonels to put an end to the state of things that threatens the army with destruction. Every day the enemy pick up several hundred prisoners. During the 20 years in which I have commanded French armies, I have never seen the commissariat service so hopelessly bad. There is no one. The men sent out here have no ability and no experience. The Battle of Borodino was the most glorious, most difficult and most creditable operation of war carried out by the Gauls, of which either ancient or modern history makes mention. Dauntless heroes, Murat, Ney, Poniatowski, it is to you the glory is due. What great, what splendid deeds history might place on record. How we charged and sabred the gunners and their guns. The heroic devotion of Montbrun, who found death in the midst of their glory. And our brave infantry, at the most critical moment, not in need of their general's steadying voice, but calling out to him, it's all right, your soldiers have sworn they will conquer, and they will. We had marched but a few miles from Moshaisk when we were astonished to find ourselves, notwithstanding our proximity to one of the great capitals of the world, in the midst of a sandy and absolutely desert waste. The army crossed the place with difficulty. Our horses were harassed and worn out with hunger and thirst, for water was as scarce as forage. The men suffered very much. We arrived at Moscow in the evening. The beautiful and splendid city of Moscow no longer exists. Rostopchin has burnt it down. 400 incendiaries have been caught in the act, all declared they were starting fires by order of the governor and the chief of the police. They were shot. The fire seems to have died out at last. Three quarters of the houses have gone. A quarter remain. Such conduct is atrocious and useless. Was the object to deprive us of a few resources? Well, those resources were in cellars that the fire did not reach. Even then, the destruction of one of the most beautiful cities in the world, the work of centuries for so slight an object, is inconceivable. If I suppose that any things were being done under the orders of your majesty, I should not write this letter, but I hold it impossible that anyone with the high principles of your majesty, such heart, such right feelings, could have authorised these excesses, unworthy as they are of a great sovereign and a great nation. I have conducted the war against your majesty with no animosity. A line written to me before or after the last battle would have stopped my march and I would gladly have foregone the advantage of entering Moscow. If anything of our old friendship remains, your majesty will take this letter in good part. Despite the poet's art, all the imaginary details of the burning of Troy can never equal the reality of that of Moscow. The city was built of wood, the wind was very strong, all the fire engines had been removed. It was literally an ocean of fire. The enemy's movement shows clearly that they are expecting reinforcements from the army of Moldavia. To march against them would be to operate in the line of their reserves and without any supporting positions. Moscow, now that it is burnt down and deserted by its inhabitants, is of no use to us. It cannot even accommodate our sick and wounded. If the army is to fall back on Smolensk, is it wise to follow up the enemy and to run the risk, while executing a movement that would look like a retreat, of losing several thousand men in the face of an army that knows the country, that has many spies and a large force of light cavalry? If we should decide to fall back so as to take up winter quarters in Poland, is it the best course to retire directly by the same road by which we came? I find it hard to believe that we need 45 days to evacuate the wounded from Moscow. For I calculate that, even if we do nothing, in those 45 days, part of them will die. Part of them will get well. We should therefore only have to evacuate those that remained. And experience shows that three months after a battle, only one-sixth of the wounded remain. 
Reckoning on 6,000, there would therefore be at the end of three months only 1,000 to move. My purpose is to keep control of the line of operations and to evacuate the wounded. The army is in motion. Tomorrow we shall decide to blow up the Kremlin and to march by Kaluga or by Vyazma, so as to arrive before severe weather sets in and get into winter quarters. All is going well. In fact, the natives are amazed at the weather of the last three weeks. We are having the sunshine and lovely days of the trip to Fontainebleau. The army is in a very rich comity that is comparable with the finest of France and Germany. Since my last letter to you, our situation has become worse. Ice and frost of near zero have killed off nearly all our horses, say, 30,000. We've been compelled to burn nearly 300 pieces of artillery and an immense quantity of transport wagons. The cold has greatly increased the number of stragglers. The Cossacks have turned to account our absolute want of cavalry and of artillery to harass us and cut our communications. I have just crossed the Berezina, but the river is full of floating ice and our bridges are therefore very insecure. The cold is very severe. The army is excessively fatigued. I have received your letter of which there is not a word of French news nor of Spanish. This makes two weeks during which I have heard nothing and I am in the dark about everything. The army is numerous, but in a frightful state of disbandment. We need two weeks to reform the men into regiments, and where can we get two weeks? Cold and privation have broken up the army. We shall soon reach Vilna. Can we stay there? Yes, if we can hold on for eight days, but if we are attacked during the first eight days, it is doubtful whether we can stay there. Food, food, food. Otherwise there are no horrors which this undisciplined mob is not capable of wreaking on the city. If 100,000 rations of bread are not awaiting us in Vilna, I am sorry for the city. An abundance of supplies is the only thing that can bring back discipline. The army is horribly worn out. This is the 45th day's march. The roads were covered with ice, the horses were dying every night, not in hundreds but in thousands, especially the French and German horses. More than 50,000 horses died in a few days. Our cavalry was dismounted, our artillery and transport had no teams. Without cavalry we could not risk a battle. We were compelled to march so as not to be forced into a battle, which we wished to avoid because of our shortness of ammunition. The enemy, marching in the footsteps of the frightful calamity that had overtaken the French army, tried to profit by it. All our columns were surrounded by Cossacks who, like the Arabs in the desert, picked up every cart or wagon that laid behind. This contemptible cavalry, which only knows how to shout and couldn't ride down so much as a company of light infantry, became formidable from the force of circumstances. It may be concluded from what was being said that the army needs to re-establish its discipline, to be re-equipped, to remount its cavalry, its artillery, and its transport. Yet during all these events, the Emperor constantly managed, in the midst of the guard, the cavalry commanded by the Duke of Istria, the infantry by the Duke of Dantag. Our cavalry was so reduced that it became necessary to form all the officers who were still mounted into four companies of 150 men each. Generals acted as captains and colonels as corporals. This sacred squadron, commanded by General Grouchy and under the orders of the King of Naples, kept the closest watch over the Emperor. His Majesty's health has never been better.